you will, turn your testaments to Acts chapter 6. Uh, read along with me the first few verses of this chapter, and this will serve as the basis of our study tonight. Acts chapter 6. Now in these days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a murmuring of the Grecian Jews against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. And the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them, and said, It is not fit that we should forsake the word of God and serve tables. Look ye out, therefore, brethren, from among you seven men of good report, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will continue steadfastly in prayer and in the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Spirit, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands upon them. The church began with about 3,000 on Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, <clears throat> but it was growing by leaps and bounds. In the uh, fourth chapter, <clears throat> in verse 14, uh, that's not verse 14, it's uh, verse 4, but we have this statement, summary statement, but many of them that heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. We assume that there were some women, maybe some uh, younger people. So uh, the number could have well uh, swelled to uh, 7,500, 10,000 by this time. But then we look again at chapter 5, verse 14. That's where I got that 14th verse a minute ago. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women. So we don't have a number there, but uh, multitudes. And then the next verse where we stopped reading in chapter 6 says, The word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem, and a great company of the feasts, uh, priests were obedient to the faith. But the very first verse tells us of the way the church was growing too, doesn't it? We read a moment ago, now in these days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there were just many, many people attracted by the gospel. The events of Pentecost were still having their effect. The miraculous activity of the apostles, not only from Pentecost, but thereafter, were having their great effect. It's interesting that the apostles are never, are only the ones spoken of as performing miracles until the passage that we've just read. It was uh, upon the 12 that the Holy Spirit was poured out, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And thus, uh, Peter standing up with the 11 began to preach the gospel to them a little bit later in that chapter. And then in Acts chapter 2, right after we read of the 3,000 obeying the gospel, <clears throat> verse 43 says, And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. The reason why I'm emphasizing this, and there are two or three other passages that state the same thing, that it was the apostles who were performing miracles is that uh, some identify the promised gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2.38 with miraculous gifts. If that were the case, it would mean that it was as general as remission of sins following repentance and baptism, it would seem. Repent ye and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, every one of you, unto the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So this was some other gift besides a miraculous gift 
Now we find that changing in the material of this sixth chapter when the apostles lay their hands upon these seven men. Only then do we begin seeing the profusion of miraculous gifts among other members of the church besides the apostles. But let's go back to chapter 6 and verse 1 and, and pick up a few things along the way here. There was a murmuring of the Grecian Jews against the Hebrews. Now, what are the distinctions here? Who are the Grecian Jews? They are people from areas of the world that uh, the Grecian culture spread by Alexander the Great had so influenced and affected. The Hebrews mentioned here were likely Jews who lived in Palestine, in the homeland of the Jews. And they resented what they considered to be liberalism in the Grecian Jews. And so uh, this uh, distinction is being made here between these two, and, and the Grecian widows are not being treated fairly, is the criticism. The daily ministration had to uh, refer to daily supplies of necessities of life that were being given to many of these pilgrims who had come for the great Pentecost feast. They'd come first for the Passover, and many had stayed over, doubtless, for the Pentecost 50 days later. But uh, some of these had obeyed the gospel, and perhaps their husbands had even died while they were in Jerusalem in that seven-week period. Many of them maybe uh, wanted to stay for the great fellowship they had found in Christ and with all of these others who were obeying the gospel. But whatever the uh, problem was that caused the need for a daily ministration, the Grecian widows said, we are being neglected. Likely some of the men came forward among these Grecian Jews with this complaint. Well, if um, the apostles had been like some elders I've known, that would say, ah, oh, don't worry about that. That's no problem. Just ignore it and it'll go away. Pull up the rug there and just sweep a little bit. And of course, when you start sweeping things under the rug, the, the lump gets bigger and bigger until finally a lot of people trip over it or it bursts and spreads all over everybody. The apostles said, all right, let's take care of this problem. But we're not the ones to do it. The Lord has given us our work. He wants us to be doing, continue doing what we are doing. The ministry of prayer and the ministry of the word, preaching the word. So look you out from among yourselves. Choose some men who are full of faith who are wise men, who are spiritual men, and appoint them over this business. So this is generally the place we go when we start thinking about appointing elders in a congregation or deacons in a congregation. We ask the congregation to submit the names, to look out from among themselves, men, who meet the qualifications laid down in 1 Timothy chapter 1, uh, chapter 3, and Titus chapter 1. And so we have a precedent for that here. And so these seven men are set forward. And they meet the approval of the apostles, obviously. And so the apostles lay their hands upon these men. Now we're not told the significance of that, in the very verse that tells us they laid their hands on them, but it will shortly become evident why they laid their hands on them, not only for the work of the daily ministration of the Grecian Jews, but for more responsibilities and abilities than just that. Were these the first deacons? I do not believe so. The brethren and I... Uh, admire and have confidence in, uh, have stated that they were. But to me, there are three reasons why these were not the first deacons. Number one, they're never called deacons. <laughs> Number two, 
the qualifications for these men are not nearly the qualifications of deacons found in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And number three, we have deacons in the church before we have elders if these were deacons. And I don't believe that that is an arrangement we find anywhere in the New Testament authorized. Now, were these men doing work typical of what elders might assign deacons to do? Absolutely so. But that does not make them deacons. So these seven men named... <coughs> only two of which become prominent afterwards, have the apostles' hands laid upon them. And we're told immediately, <clears throat> first, that the word of God increased. That doesn't mean that uh, the Bible is getting bigger. <laughs> it simply means that the effect of the word of God was increasing. More and more people were being attracted to it. A great number of disciples multiplied. Even the priestly class was being attracted to the gospel. And then we start reading about Stephen. One of these seven. Well, he not only was uh, a man that uh, was going to be serving these tables, but he was some kind of evangelist himself, wasn't he? Powerful man with the word of God. And uh, one of the longest sermons we have recorded in the entire New Testament is the sermon that Stephen preached, recorded here, in chapter 7. Well, <clears throat> Stephen was a troublemaker. Says he was full of grace and power, and then wrought great wonders among the people. You know, this... Um, little upset here about the Grecian widows is uh, about the first major problem that occurred that affected a number of members of the church, apparently, in Jerusalem. Because from the start, we can start reading back in Acts chapter 2, that uh, they were all with one accord, verse 46, continuing steadfastly with one accord in the temple, breaking bread at home. They took their food with gladness and singleness of heart. They were one, brethren, just like we're one here. And then uh, <clears throat> when the apostles, for the first time, Peter and John were arrested and, and warned not to preach anymore, and they came back and, and um, they met with the brethren and prayed with them. We read in that context as well. Verse 32 of chapter 4, The multitude of them that believed were of one heart and soul. So there was great unity among the brethren. And that's how the Lord wants it, as long as the unity is based upon truth. He doesn't approve of another kind of unity that's based upon compromise and error, but these brethren were one in the truth, in the gospel. They loved the Lord and they loved each other. Brethren, that's how God wants it to be. And may it ever be so among us. Now, um, maybe a little bit of the background of these Grecian widows and why they needed daily necessities of life can be found, again, beginning in Acts chapter 2. Verse 45 says, well, verse 44, beginning, All that believed were together and had all things common. They sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all according as any man had need. So there was a need from the very beginning for the necessities of life that some were not able to provide for themselves. Oh, that's communism in the, in the New Testament church. Communism there in Jerusalem. No, communism puts a gun to your head and says, we want you to share with everybody. <laughs> give us your land, give us your jewelry, give us your money, give us everything you have so we can decide who deserves it most. All oh, these willingly did this. It was the kind of giving that Paul instructed the Corinthians to engage in in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. Not grudging nor of necessity, God loves a cheerful giver. And these were cheerful, willing, and generous givers. Well, to go along with this, uh, the 
fourth chapter closes, well, let's back up to verse uh, 34 of chapter 4. Neither was there among them any that lacked, as many as were possessors of lands or houses, sold them, brought the prices of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto each, according as each one had need. And then there was a certain man singled out who did this. Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is, being interpreted, son of exhortation, a Levite, a man of Cyprus by race, having a field, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So this is coming to be a pattern, you see, of meeting the needs of those who could not, could not meet their own needs. The Lord has always been very, very plain in his teachings about that, that we ought to help the helpless. We're not obligated to help those who can help themselves and refuse to do so, but to help those who can help themselves. If any will not work, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, he doesn't deserve to eat, neither let him eat. These people were in a helpless situation, not of their own making, nor of their own remedy, apparently. So here's Barnabas. He sells a piece of land, and that introduces to us the first problem that arises among the brethren. Now, it's not a general problem. It just centers on two people, a husband and a wife, named Ananias and Sapphira. They see uh, Barnabas here gave a piece of land, and look at all the people that are patting him on the back. Just look at the praise he's getting and the attention that he's getting. Now, I'm reading a little bit into it, admittedly, but I, I think it's justified. <laughs> Something inspired Ananias and Sapphira to get together and conspire with each other. Look, we've got this piece of land over here. We can have a win-win situation. Let's sell this property, and we'll lay it at the apostles' feet just like good old Barnabas did with his. And we'll let everybody think that that's the whole price, but we'll keep some of it back for ourselves. Nobody will know the difference. And so Ananias brings his in. Did you sell this property for so much? Peter said, oh, no, why did he ask me that question? <laughs> now I've got to either tell the truth and be embarrassed or lie. Yes, for so much. You've lied to the Holy Spirit. You've lied to God. Struck him dead. Well, before his body was cold, Sapphira comes in, and she brings her portion, lays it at the apostles' feet. Peter says, did you sell this property for so much? Yes, for so much. They had their stories straight. The young men that carried your husband's body out will carry you out. And so uh, that kind of church discipline had a stellar effect upon the brethren and upon many others as well. So the fifth chapter, the latter part of it, tells us, as we read from verse 14, believers were the more added unto them, multitudes of people, and the great healings that the apostles did in the wake of that great miracle of uh, depriving Ananias and Sapphira of their lives. Well, <clears throat> just this one other point, and we'll start drawing to a close, about the laying on of the hands by the apostles to impart these gifts to Stephen and Philip. Unfortunately, Stephen did not get to use those gifts very much, apparently, before his life was taken from him as a martyr. But then the record takes up after Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 8, with Philip, another one of those seven. And he goes down to Samaria, and he begins preaching the gospel, preaches the kingdom of God, Luke says, concerning him, the good tidings concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. 
And it says in result of that, verse 12, they were baptized, both men and women. Now, a little bit later in Acts chapter 8, we'll read about this same Philip who preached Jesus unto the Ethiopian, and this man wanted to be baptized. Now, it's no coincidence that when you preach the gospel and the kingdom of Christ, you're going to tell people to be baptized. They're going to learn that they need to be baptized. We see two cases of it here just in this one chapter. But there's a man there in Samaria who has a very, very great reputation as being a miracle worker. His name is Simon, but he's a sorcerer. He's a black magician. I don't know about you, but I enjoy watching uh, illusionists and magicians and being amazed at the things they can do with the hand quicker than the eye and things of that sort. And there's not anything wrong with that. But this man was saying, I have the power of God to do these things. And yet he was just a trickster. So Philip began performing miracles there. And Simon was pretty smart. He knew that Philip had the real thing and was doing the real thing. He was no sorcerer. And then when Peter and John in Jerusalem heard that the gospel was making progress in Samaria and that people were obeying the gospel, they went down to Samaria. And when they got there, they laid their hands on and imparted gifts of the Holy Spirit to some of those who had obeyed the gospel in Samaria. Well, here's Simon observing this now. Now, these men can not only perform miracles, they can enable others to perform miracles. That's what I want. I want the taproot. I want the source. And so he comes to Peter and John, Peter being the spokesman. He says, uh, how much will it cost for you to give me this power? And here's where Peter really gave him a tongue lashing. Your money perish with you. You have neither part nor lot in this matter. And verse 11 that we often quote is the second plan of pardon for those who are Christians and fall away because Simon had obeyed the gospel. You repent and pray God that the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. We see this pattern concerning spiritual gifts in other places in the New Testament. Only the apostles could pass the gift on. They could enable others to do the gifts, but only they could pass them on. The Lord was thus controlling them through these inspired men, controlling these gifts in that way. Parceling them to the ones who could be entrusted to use them wisely to God's glory. Well, I think this is a significant uh, section right here in Acts chapter 6, uh, if nothing else, because <clears throat> of what it does show us about the transmission and impartation of spiritual gifts and how they proceeded to others. Now, what conclusion do we reach when the last apostle died about the spiritual gifts? If they were the only ones who could transmit the gifts to others, when the last apostle died, the ability to transmit those gifts died with them. And when the last brother or sister upon whom one of these gifts had been given died in the early part or middle part of the second century or whenever it might have been, miraculous gifts faded from the scene of history. They were no longer needed, though. Because as Acts, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 tells us, the gifts were given until that which is perfect has come. And when that which is perfect has come, meaning the completed revelation of God in the New Testament as we have it, then that 
which is in part the gifts shall be done away. And it happened just as Paul said it would. We mentioned baptism a moment ago. The people in uh, Samaria were indeed baptized after they heard the preaching of the kingdom of God and the gospel of that kingdom. But that which led up to their baptism was the same thing that led up to the baptism of the 3,000 on Pentecost. Baptism is not just coming along someday and saying, I'm going to be baptized for a religious or spiritual purpose. Baptism must have its proper precedence. Faith has its precedent. One must hear the word of God or he can't believe it, Romans chapter 10. When one believes the word of God, he cannot keep it in his heart to himself, though. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Verses 9 or verse 10 of Romans 10. And it's clear on Pentecost that after those people believed in the Lord and implied their confession of their faith by the very question they asked, what shall we do? Infidels don't ask gospel preachers, what shall we do to be saved? They were confessing their faith. That's why Peter didn't say repent, confess, and be baptized. He didn't have to say confess. They had already made that known in their question. And so when they asked this question, Peter says, here's what you do. Repent ye, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, unto the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The grand beginning of the church of the Lord, the kingdom of the prophets, had its beginning on that occasion and as a result of that sermon. The 3,000 gladly received his word and were baptized. You can always count on this that when one gladly receives the word of God that teaches him to repent and be baptized upon his confessed faith, he will never question baptism. On the other hand, when one questions baptism, why do I need to be baptized? The Bible just says we're saved by faith. When he questions baptism, you know he hasn't gladly received the word of God. It always works that way. Is anyone listening to me tonight who has not confessed her faith in Christ, turned away from sin to serve Christ and Him alone, in a dark world that needs lights, and has not been baptized into Christ so that the sins of the past can be washed away by Jesus' blood? Oh, my dear friend, there's nothing more important and urgent for you to do than that. This night, if you need to, or at your first opportunity otherwise. Will you come while we stand and sing?